Topic is the part of estate planning called the durable power of attorney for financial management. I personally do not know much about it so I will be learning a lot of new things today. Mr. Crandall has a professional practice in Walnut Creek, California and his firm provides estate, trust and income tax services. The projects include estate planning, estate administration, probate, at times estate litigation as well as income tax for individuals, businesses and estates. He is an attorney and a CPA with a background in real estate. He teaches classes on estate planning, estate administration and court accounting that is done for trusts, probate assets, guardianships and conservatorships. He likes to creatively solve problems that help people. His mission in life is to help as many people as possible solve problems and maintain self-sufficiency. I could go on, but we need to start the class. So help me welcome Rex Crandall. Well, thank you, British lady. <laughs> uh, today we're going to be talking about durable powers of attorney. And I must admit, I learned a whole lot about this subject by preparing for this talk. Uh, digging around, finding problems, solutions. There's, I found solutions I didn't even know there were problems for. So... Uh, Let's get started. So I added a little disclaimer, kind of generic. Um, what are we going to do tonight? We're going to talk about durable powers of attorney for finance. It also can be just for every kind of asset. What happens when my to my finances when I become incapacitated? What happens if I do not have a DPOA and become incapacitated? What powers can I give my agent under my durable power of attorney? What risks do my assets have and my beneficiaries for using or not using the durable power of attorney? And how does it work in real life? Who should I name as my pension plan beneficiaries and for my life insurance beneficiaries? So that's what we're going to talk about. So looking forward in your life and time you've got two choices you can either become incapacitated or you can pass away it's uh it's kind of an either or but let's take the first one because it's part of estate planning and if you become incapacitated and you do have a health care directive then your agent takes over talks to the doctors for you makes decisions become incapacitated and you have a durable power of attorney for finance, your agent takes over. Um, both of those documents uh, cease on death. And then after passing away, you look for beneficiary designations that uh, would avoid probate, like uh, pay on death accounts or beneficiaries for pensions, uh, joint tenancy or joint accounts, look for wills, find out um, who the executor is, maybe guardians, and then trustee takes over. So first of all, what is a power of attorney? You're basically separating from you a power that you have to control your own assets. The person you appoint technically is an attorney in fact, but it's easier I think to use the word uh, agent and the agent has rights for controlling your assets. It is it is a license to act for you, but it's also a license potentially for somebody to steal from you, which we'll talk about more. This is California's view of enabling the durable power of attorney. So what they say here in the statute that your document must say that it's still going to be effective if you become incapacitated because a um, general power of attorney is void if you become incapacitated. But this is a carve out in the law. And all the items like contracts or other things that your agent does 
you're fully liable for. What happens if you become incapacitated? Well, as I mentioned, the healthcare directive, your agent would take over. What if you don't have an agent? Then you get the unsavory aspect of having to go to court to get a conservatorship of the person appointed. And uh, we deal with conservators and it's a lot of work. Um, conservator the person is just over the person, food, living, clothing, uh, all that type of thing. But it, you have court reports, it's a lot of work for that person who is being the, um, the conservator. And if you become incapacitated for finances, then your durable power of attorney finance takes over. If you don't have one and you become incapacitated, then you have to go to court, get a conservatorship of the estate. And guardianships are for people under 18. Conservatorships are for people over 18. And people talk about them as one type, but they're not, they're two. One is conservator the person, and then they have no rights to touch any money. If the person's only the conservator of the estate, they have no authority over living conditions and things like that. Um, oftentimes they're both, but most of the pro per uh, applicants that I see going to court for conservatorships, they only take the conservatorship of the person and they kind of wing it the best they can on the conservatorship of the estate. How can a power of attorney help me? So it authorizes somebody to take over your responsibilities, signing documents, paying your bills, car payments, things like that. Um, and then on that thing about paying bills, um, as part of a power of attorney, since so many people are using digital things, uh, like for, I've got bill pay on my checking account. So my agent would need to get access to my bank account in order to online in order to access the bill pay. Otherwise, um, it's a problem. So just keep that in mind and estate planning documents have a place where your passwords and your access is available for your agent. Uh, your attorney fact can pay your bills. Um, and also, uh, Whatever language you put into the power of attorney, you can do that. There's only a few things you can have, do not have the right to put in. Um, some examples, things you might want your agent to do, bank deposits, trading. This is all on the financial side. Um, buy, sell property, which you have to have uh, recorded documents, which we'll cover. Hire people, caregivers, contracts, contact SSI and Medi-Cal. Um, it is handy to keep in a durable power of attorney, giving the agent the right to delegate. So if they're gonna, for example, be gone on a trip for a month, they can easily delegate to another person who takes over without having to uh, a lot of paperwork or problems. And uh, a nice thing about it, if, if the power of attorney grants it, that it would allow somebody who forgot to put a property, real property into the trust. So you would have uh, probate avoidance. And um, it, it doesn't say it in the outline, but if you come across a problem where the person's incapacitated and they don't have a trust or they have a trust and the house is not in it. Or even if they don't have a house and uh, they don't have a trust, but they do have real property, you want to try to avoid probate. So what you do is you go to court and ask, you file a petition for substituted judgment. And what this petition is about 
you say, Your Honor, this person needs an estate plan. They don't have any. I'm the, you know, I'm the uh, attorney, in fact. And this is a natural disposition uh, of assets. And we would like to have a trust created and have an order allowing the house to be put in the trust. And um, so the, the judge can do it. And that's really good because especially we'll talk about Medi-Cal later, but if somebody's incapacitated, they go in a, a healthcare a home, a skilled nursing facility, after the person dies, uh, Medi-Cal comes in and claws back and takes the house away for, it might be $700,000 worth of payments. Anyway, we'll cover a little bit more of that later. Your agent can do anything your power of attorney says they can do. You give them the uh, ability. You can, uh, a lot of, I, I don't know what the ratio is, but most of the power of attorneys I have done have been effective when a doctor signs the person's incapacitated. But I know other estate planning firms who like to have it effective immediately. And there's a couple things that your agent cannot do for you, like get married and uh, adopt children. It's kind of funny when you look at capacity for different things. There's capacity to make a will, which is different from capacity to uh, sign contracts. But I find it humorous that the lowest level of capacity allowed by law is to get married. So... <laughs> You could have an IQ of two above a tree and still get married. So anyway, um, yeah, your agent cannot vote for you uh, unless you're in Pennsylvania and they let everybody, even dead people vote. So, but in California, you can't do that. Um, and then uh, anything that you're, you've restricted within your uh, document, the agent does not have the right to do. So what can the agent change? California law expressly says agents under DPOA cannot change a will. But your agent can create a trust and also potentially, um, you know, change a trust, that type of thing. So, so it is some, a power that can be authorized. Can my agent use my assets? Well, this brings up the subject of co-mingling. Your agents cannot mix their money with yours. And if they start using your assets, it brings up a problem of self-dealing, a breach of fiduciary duty. So the general rule is, no, your agent cannot like make gifts to themselves or for them to take gifts uh, self-designated, um, your agent is supposed to only buy things and spend for your best interest. And um, if you're over 65 and the agent does improperly take your property, they could be charged with uh, elder financial abuse crime. Um, and there's also a, a dichotomy. You can give your agent the right to have a specific type of gift and that's okay and in the rest of the document you can say it doesn't apply to anything else so you can kind of split it into two parts if you if that's what you want um back on and eh, no, i'll hold off on that one what if i want to give a gift to my agent okay this is what i just said basically if your, if your document says they can have a gift, that's fine. Otherwise, it's going to be restricted. Um, making gifts to themselves, it's a bit of a problem. And um, one thing that I have noticed is kind of alarming to me is that a lot of the standard DPOA documents just right away give the agent the ability to change beneficiaries on pensions. 
and annuities. And I kind of don't feel real comfortable with that. So what I frequently will do is change the wording to say, yeah, you can change the beneficiaries on the pension plan or the annuity, but you can only name the trust if you're going to change it. So at least it, it clips it a little bit. That's a good idea. Whoa, I hit end. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, let me uh, go back and find my place. Okay, now is it safe? Is it safe to uh, use a durable power of attorney? The answer is yes, if the person you appoint is trustworthy and competent. So you should have absolute faith and trust in the person or don't appoint them. Um, because a person can access all of your accounts and perform all kinds of transactions. Um, they could easily potentially steal your assets. Uh, as I go through here, I'll point out things that are not in your outline because I kept, I didn't stop adding to my outline before I turned it in. The bottom two items. So I was thinking that if you're worried about an agent taking money from the principal, what about getting a fidelity bond like we do in probate? And I just made a couple calls and what I found out was that the bonding companies are hung up on getting court authority before they issue a bond. And if you have to get, if you want a bond and you have to go to court, well, that defeats the whole purpose of the durable power of attorneys to keep it out of court. So I, I don't know if it's just a misconception, but I mean, the bonding companies will give bonds for guardians, conservators, probate, uh, trusts, um, but this kind of in between place with the durable power of attorney, I didn't have any luck finding anyone. Um, yeah, another problem with the DPOA and attorney, in fact, in general, powers of attorney, is if by chance your agent takes money improperly and you say, okay, well, I'm going to call the police and take care of that. Don't be surprised if the police are less than enthusiastic about enforcement. They'll go, well, did you give them the right? Yeah, but they weren't supposed to take anything. Well, you shouldn't have given them the right. So I wouldn't uh, bank on having um, a lot of police support if, if there is a problem. Can I appoint more than one financial agent? Yes, you can appoint two or three. Um, the problem with appointing two is they both have to agree. And if they don't agree and you're incapacitated, then they have to go to court to find out what's in your best interest. Um, another problem, if you have the power to delegate each of the two agents could delegate to a different person without communicating. So there could be some confusion. Um, my general rule is after seeing um, severe trust litigation with three trustees, I try to stay away from multiple parties because if one's in charge, they have the vote and they don't have to get a lot of other opinions. And some people feel um, morally bound that they should have more than one to treat all their kids equally or something like that. I, I would advise people not to worry about hurting anybody's feeling. Just pick the person who's most responsible and tell the others they're the alternates. And uh, as I mentioned, it's good to have in the right to delegate permanently or or temporarily to another agent. Once my durable power of attorney is in effect, can I still make my own decisions? 
assuming it was not effective when, uh, or it was effective immediately on signing. And yes, you still have the right to make your own decisions as long as you're of a sound mind and haven't lost all your marbles, you can uh, continue to make your own decision. Okay, so one of the decision, the biggest decision on a durable power of attorney is who's gonna be the attorney and factor agent. The next biggest decision is when does it go into effect? Do you want it to go into effect immediately? You can. You can also have your document created to go into effect immediately, but under California law, your agent cannot take any action until they sign acceptance of their responsibility. So technically you could make it effective immediately and keep it out of uh, reach of the agent where a third party could access like a home safe or safe deposit box or something like that. But um, the, that's what, something to keep in mind. A lot of times people are lax about having the agent assume that responsibility, but they cannot use that power in California without the agent signing up for it and on the, on the form. Um, this is a, a real life situation where you've got a durable power of attorney. Say you've got a big stock brokerage account and you say, well, hell, Merrill Lynch, uh, yeah, I've got, you know, two or three million in there, but they'll, they'll believe my durable power of attorney. I think it's a good idea to go to the vendor of ba banks and uh, uh, financial institutions and fill out their form. In addition to the durable power of attorney you have created here. And the purpose is some companies are not as tough on the um, agent if they see their own form was also used. Um, but the caveat here is make sure you don't include any conflicting terms between the two documents. Um, most durable powers of attorney that I see that are going to become effective on incapacity will name one or two doctors or require one or two doctors to sign off on that. And that can be a problem. You know, some of the doctors are worried about signing and worrying about liability. Um, one idea would be to put a disclaimer in there for a doctor stating that any doctor that signs an incapacity letter cannot be sued by any uh, beneficiary or they'll be uh, indemnified by the estate. Um, but on the other hand, there's no law that says you need to have a doctor to determine incapacity. You could have anybody determine incapacity. You just state that person or person one and alternate and alternate and they a family member can determine incapacity you know uncle uncle jed just lost his marbles we're going to have to you know uh activate his thorough power of attorney here so keep that in mind it makes it easier i i know when i have clients going to get the uh attorney uh the doctor's letters it's always a tough case because some people don't realize, they don't admit it to themselves that they don't have capacity. So they may try to be kicking and fighting, and uh, but they really can't do what they used to. Uh, you see that in court too. Anyway, just keep that in mind. You can have anybody. How long does a power of attorney last? Um, you can give it an expiration date and most of them do not expire, or it can be on regaining competency. Um, it'll be valid until you die, unless um, there's some other limiting factor. Um, and I, I, 
I thought of this problem. What if you have an agent under a durable power of attorney that is really cutting up and taking money and being uh, irresponsible? How do you get them out? Well, what we I came up with is you go to the court and file for a conservatorship and then have the judge terminate the DPOA. Or I suppose you could put in, um, you know, like we talk about the uh, trust protector, you could have a, a built-in office called a DPOA protector so that they have an override uh, ability. But the general rule of when a durable power of attorney expires, it expires when you do. So except in Switzerland, they have them that go beyond death. So speaking of Switzerland, I've known forever that Switzerland has had uh, durable powers of attorney that go beyond death. And for this presentation, I looked up the law in Switzerland and I found out an interesting way that it works. The general public cannot have in Switzerland or under Swiss law. So if you've got a Swiss bank account with 250 million in it, um, you can have a durable power of attorney that lasts beyond death. And um, by the way, Swiss bank accounts are not illegal, immoral or fattening. And they, um, as long as you tell IRS and FinCEN about them, uh, there's nothing uh, bad about them at all. But the way that it works in Switzerland is the banks say, we have this durable power of attorney that goes beyond death. Fine. So the client thinks that's how it works, but it doesn't. What happens is, let's say the person died and the bank didn't know it, and somebody took a lot of money out of the account. The attorney, in fact. So that protects the bank. They say, hey, the durable power of attorney is still, or not durable, and this one's beyond death. So the bank is protected. So on the other hand, when any of the bank customers come in and say, you know, that the main customer has died, and I'm still using the durable power of attorney, durable, beyond death, then the banks close the account down <laughs> so that you can't even get the money out. So either way, it's, it's not to benefit the customer, but in fact, um, Switzerland has it uh, in case you like international banking. Okay, where do you get the power of attorney form? Um, what a lot of people do is they use the uh, statutory form. You can get them online a lot of different sources. Um, I was looking, playing around today and found probably five or six sources for the statutory um, durable power of attorney. Um, you, if you get one online that's been edited, you might want to bring up the probate code section 4401 to make sure that the wording is very similar because most of the banks and uh, title companies, um, they're familiar with the, the statutory type form. And I've already mentioned about using um, some of the vendor forms. Um, if, if you haven't worked with a durable power of attorney, um, the statutory one, it uh, is quite simple. And then there's boxes that you can check that you want real estate affected, uh, personal property, stocks. You pick off the ones that you want or you have a checkbox that says, oh, I want all of the above. So it's uh, pretty straightforward and not, not a lot of legal ease. What do I need to know to write in my power of attorney? First, decide what powers you want to give if you become incapacitated and your responsibilities. 
So if you have a horse ranch, for example, you need special kind of management for the property and the and the horses, then you might want to have, uh, you know, lined up a, an alternate management to do that. Um, your faith in the honesty and integrity of the agent is, is paramount. Um, and it's also suggested that you or whoever's doing the DPOA, DPOA read up on it and see what is said on it and get an idea of what kind of universe they're in. Um, sometimes people will say, if you don't know anybody you trust, maybe your banker or a CPA or something like that. But I advise people not to use institutional agents because I don't know about your banks, but every time I go in the banks, they've got different people. It's like a merry-go-round. So if you name the bank and you trust the person that you deal with, name them as an individual rather than a company. And uh, I think that's a safer bet. How do I know power of attorneys valid? Well, it'd be nice if it was signed and you have two choices. You can either notarize it or have it witnessed by two witnesses of which the agent cannot be one of the witnesses. And if you notarize it, the notary can't be the witness. You can also do both. You don't have to notarize and witness. But that third bullet point there is, is uh, critical for real property. You must have your DPOA notarized if you have real property so they can transfer it into the trust, for example. And you can't record it unless it's notarized. So my default is have them all notarized. And if you ever have to um, record a durable power of attorney, you'll find that they're usually not made so that you can record them because the recorders have these requirements like three and a half inches on the top of the form and you know how much margin and all this for the first page. So what you have to do is you get a recording cover page that meets the margin and the heading requirements and then you label that cover sheet uh, durable power of attorney. And that would be an acceptable way to get your document recorded without trying to jury rig it. Um, some software you can go in and if you have the ability, drop it down three inches, three and a half inches from the top margin on page one. Then you already know it, it is, has the ability to be recorded. Okay, so what happens if you have a durable power of attorney and later the court appoints a conservator? Um, unless the court is not happy with the, the agent, the uh, power of attorney can still be in effect. Um, and of course, like always, the agent would have to uh, tell the principal uh, all the transactions that were done on their behalf. Um, one thing that's kind of, uh, I guess you kind of misnomer, oxymoron or something. So you got this term, you got a person who's attorney in fact, a person's incompetent. Okay, so the attorney in fact goes down to file for a conservatorship and they're kicked out of court because an attorney, in fact, cannot act like an attorney in court. It's not permitted. The uh, person has to hire uh, a law firm to be able to represent the incapacitated person. This is a common question. 
how do I sign the documents for an agent under a durable power of attorney or any power of attorney for that matter? So we have Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta Jones. So this first method is what I like the best. A Michael Douglas by Catherine Zeta Jones, attorney in fact. And um, especially on, I get a lot of them where uh, we're doing tax and the person's incapacitated and uh, they have to sign and, and you just, that's the best way I think. But these alternate ways are okay. They're acceptable um, using it under a DPOA or describing it as a, an attorney in fact. So um, if you're taking notes, these two items on the bottom are not in your outline. Uh, for signing tax returns, as I mentioned, I use the first of the three, but um, in the tax arena for the individual, there's a form, IRS form 56. And what that is, it can come up in the um, fiduciary returns, like after the decedent's estate. But in this example, the agent now has taken over the tax reporting responsibility. So you fill out the IRS form 56. So you're telling the IRS that, hey, I'm responsible here. And then you would send in a copy of the durable power of attorney and fortunately, the IRS is somewhat lax. Uh, copies of signatures are acceptable. So that's one process. The other process with the IRS is an IRS Form 2848, and it's the official IRS power of attorney form. That one is less needed in this kind of circumstance. It, it normally allows a person who has capacity to give the right to someone else, like a CPA or an attorney, to deal with the IRS. Uh, here, it's a bit of a problem because the attorney, in fact, has all the rights. The incapacitated principal can't sign anything. And so it would be the attorney, in fact, authorizing themselves to act. So I'm not sure how useful that would be, uh, perhaps in an audit or a, uh, we do tax court cases, maybe there. Um, so those are some things to look into. The other one that I added after the outline was done is my requirement on all documents and that's use blue ink. And, uh, and the idea there is they'll tell you, well, let's say the court wants a uh, an original signature well that was all fine and dandy until we got color printers <laughs> now you can scan them in and print them out on a color printer and have a blue copy but uh anyway i still follow the ritual well rex let me stop you there we do have a couple yeah. of questions in the sure. chat before you go on, um, I think this goes back to the, somebody was asking about, it says, you state that a notary can also be the, cannot also be the witness. It is commonly done everywhere I have worked. Can you elaborate? Yes. Um, so the requirement is one or the other. You have a notary, you're done. Or you can have two witnesses and you're done. If you have, so if you decide to do both, it's what they call supernumeration where you don't have to, so it has no impact. And if it's notarized and the person is signing as a witness too, I don't think it's valid, but there's no harm, no foul because it's already effective because of the notary. I just okay. wouldn't recommend it. Okay. The next one is you said that docu this you said this document should be notarized and recorded. Where should it be recorded? Okay, let me clarify what I said. I did not say globally that all durable power of attorney should be recorded. And I don't think they should be. Only in the case where 
the agent, the attorney in fact, has real property that the person owns and they need to do something to affect the title, either transfer it to a trust or sell it or some other transaction involving title. So if there's no real estate, don't do it. If you have real estate, don't record it. If you have real estate and you're not having to, to change title or anything, don't record it. And um, the, where to record it, uh, some people call it the land records office. In California, we call it the clerk recorder. So every county has a clerk recorder's office. And that's where you would uh, get the cover sheet if need be. And uh, recorded at that point and that is when you must have the notary okay there's one more from colleen it says she says conservators can be named in the document in her software she has never recorded a poa or witnessed one only notarized so i think that's kind of a statement i think you use the same software as colleen does so probably that's yeah connected. i use california wills and trusts right so and does um it's not that common that you have to get them notarized. Okay. One but, more. Yeah. Can it can it be recorded at a future date if the need should arise to transfer title, sell real property, et cetera? Yes, is the answer. So okay. you have it all notarized. It's just sitting in the in the uh, state planning binder. Person becomes incapacitated and we got to move the house into the trust. <laughs> Yes, you can record it then. Okay, cool. All right, so that's the question. So we've got about 15 minutes or so. Okay. Well, let's see if I can find some humorous things to say in 15 minutes. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay, so uh, where are we here? Maybe we don't dispute about the attorney effect. Okay, I think I already mentioned this one where um, if you have a problem with it, uh, an attorney, in fact, you can go to the probate department and get the court to appoint a conservator. Yeah, it's already covered. Can I change or cancel my power of attorney? Yes. There's two things. One is it's recommended, well, you have to cancel it in writing. If you can get your original documents all back, you can mark them out void or shred them. Um, if you've given them to any institutions, you want to make sure that they have the old one. And um, if it is from an institution, when you make the new one out, it would uh, delete the prior one. Um, and If you had it recorded already, then you have to record a cancellation. Otherwise it's not effective. And, and anybody that has the power of attorney or relies on it, you're still liable unless you can prove that they had notice it was revoked. So obviously the first person you wanna tell and have it documented is the agent that's uh, being replaced or changed. Um, and it doesn't have to be changing the agent. It can be changing any other terms. Um, but there's something else I would do. It's kind of a belt and suspenders thing. I would do a cancellation in writing. There's forms for it. And on the new one that I did, I would also cancel it within the new document and refer to it by date. So it's doubly canceled. Okay, so what happens if your agent has problems recognizing or accepting um, your durable power of attorney? Um, what we do is we inform the bank or the credit union, whoever, that we're gonna go to court and they're gonna be responsible for the fees because they're not um, honoring a valid document. And that's another reason why I, I'm always advising people to do one for them, the normal, normal 
pre-printed durable powers of attorney, but also fill out the one at the institution. You won't have that kind of problem. So, and there's a code section if you want to look it up. Okay, here's the game show part of tonight's class. And the winner will win $100,000 of Monopoly money. Okay, so the game here is we have a list of people who can file judicial proceedings on a durable power of attorney. And the, the goal of what you're trying to do is tell me one person who would not be able to file court proceedings. Just one. So who can file? By any of the following persons can file. The attorney in fact, the principal, the spouse of the principal, the relative of the principal, the conservator of the person or the estate, the court investigator who works in the probate department, the public guardian who works for the county, the personal representative or trustee of the principal's estate, the principal's successor in interest, a person who is requested in writing by the attorney in fact to take action, and any other interested person or friend of the principal. So, ladies and gentlemen, for $100,000, who's left out? <laughs> eh, time's up. Nobody. <laughs> Just about anybody who can uh, see over the bench can file a case on a durable harbiturant. So, what types of powers of attorney are there? The most, I mean, frequently I see general powers of attorney, which are pretty wild, unwieldy, it lets a person do anything. Um, and those are not effective if the person becomes incapacitated. Um, another type of um, power of attorney is the limited power. So you can say, leaving for three weeks, I got a real estate closing, I need you to sign documents and you work it out with the title company and it's only for that one purpose and then it's done. Then the durable power of attorney, um, that's what we've been talking about and it's just another type of durable, the, <laughs> what I call the singing power of attorney, no, springing. So, it doesn't come into effect until incapacity or some other event. You can have any event that you want to make it come into effect. Um, on the, um, the power of attorney, the agent really has a lot of responsibility. And I came up with a, a situation that um, I'd heard. I don't know how accurate it was. It may not even be accurate, but these, the parents were going over to Europe for two months and they gave the durable power of attorney to their son. It was uh, and, and effective immediately, one for husband, one for wife. So they go on their trip and then about halfway through their trip, they get an email from the son. And, and one of them says to the other spouse, oh, look, at, we got an email from our son. He said, yeah, I decided you've been in this house for over 40 years and you were probably bored, so I sold your house. Is that a time? No. What is it? So I sold your house. And then I needed some extra money because I'm starting a business and I emptied out your pension plans. And I put all my money, all the money in a new business, which you're going to make a lot. I'm going to be selling dry ice to the people that live in Alaska. So um, I guess that would be considered a, a worst case scenario. Uh, limiting, yeah, this one I've mentioned um, briefly before, a lot of the powers of attorney allow the agent to change beneficiaries on pensions and life insurance. I don't feel comfortable with that. So, um, Another reason why you don't want to directly name a trust as a beneficiary on a pension 
plan or an annuity is that there are tax benefits if an individual is the beneficiary, like they can roll over the funds and not pay tax on it. If a person's um, over age 72 and they're getting annual minimum distributions they have to take, uh, the beneficiary can continue that for a time. So it's not a good idea to name um, the trust as a beneficiary on pensions, life insurance, well, not life insurance, but annuities, pensions and annuities. Okay. So this is critical in certain situations. So if a person has to do with the rights to give gifts, and if a person is going into a skilled nursing facility, Medi-Cal will pay the payments and it might be 5,000 a month. But if the person has a lot of assets, then they don't qualify. So one of the rights that an agent may have is to make gifts to make the estate smaller so the person qualifies for Medi-Cal and their assets don't um, disqualify them. However, Medi-Cal goes back for 30 months to see if you made any gifts. And if you did large gifts uh, for less than fair market value, they will take that amount out of your um, skilled nursing facility. So in the example you gave the son two years ago, 60,000 to pay his mortgage, the average private pay rate now is for skilled nursing facilities, 10,200. So that would mean the person would uh, be disqualified for the first six months. So happens in certain circumstances and it's a big deal when it does. Um, using old documents, I'd say try to update them every three to five years. The uh, cost of repair one is small compared to conservatorship costs. And your loved ones will probably think it's a minor miracle that you had the foresight to create one um, if it becomes necessary. So in overview, since no one can, can predict when or if they'll become incapacitated, it is logical that a durable power of attorney finance should be part of your estate plan. Um, and just a reminder, if you own real estate, have the document notarized. Um, the uh, cost of a DPOA is way smaller than court proceedings. And that's about it. So uh, what other <laughs> questions do people have? Um, yeah, I'm going to start with the, I'll go back to where we left off for the okay. questions. Let's see. Um, Lisa said, had to record a, P, a POA in Alabama, client is in California, did not put a cover sheet on it, court put file stamp on it. Will that create a problem for the agent to use POA in future? Okay, did you say that the county did not record it and the judge did stamp it or the court stamped it? She, it looks like she didn't put a cover sheet on it, but the court, or maybe she meant the recorder, put the file stamp on it. Hmm. Or it says court, so I'm not sure. Maybe Lisa could. Well, one thing about the Southern states is uh, we've had clients that have had probate in other states and they are so simple compared to California. Yeah, everything is. Yeah, and uh, so whether it's good or not, I mean, if it was stamped by the court, well, you know, it's got the blessing of the court. And if it was recorded, I, I don't know where the problem would be, uh, potentially if you had, if you had uh, to, real if property. She, uh, she what I would, be, what I would suggest, Go ahead. Okay. She had to be. 
Uh, you got muted, sorry. We, we can't have everybody talking. Okay, so um, if, if real property is involved, it needs to be recorded. Um, what I would suggest a person do if there's a question about real property is talk to a title company in Alabama. The title companies frequently make the rules because they're insuring title. Um, and if you have real property in California, then you would want to record it in California and Alabama's recording would have no jurisdiction over California property. So I hope that answered it. Hey, um, if so if you make a durable power of attorney effective immediately, it is a DPOA, but if you make it effective upon defined, you, you make it effective this, upon I'm defined incapacity. Is it springing? Is it what? Springing. Ah, yes. The term springing means you've got the document, it's not effective, doesn't work. Okay, so when you get whoever is uh, identified as the person determining incapacity, then the term springing, so it, now it's effective. Okay, can you uh, re <clears throat> please repeat the term mentioned earlier concerning the agent petitioning court called petition for substituted? Okay, that one's really helpful. That's a petition for substituted judgment and you're bringing a petition so that the court can supervise the creation of a state plan. Mm -hmm. And you bring in the proposed state plan to the judge and uh, they usually will cooperate with that if you have a normal distribution plan, for example, three kids and all of the assets are split equally. Um, if you have an unequal distribution plan, you'll probably meet some resistance, but it is called a petition for substituted judgment. So you're substituting the courts giving the judgment, not the person. Okay, if property is already deeded to the trust, is it still beneficial to record the durable power of attorney? If the property's in the trust, I don't see any reason to record it. There, because it's, it's already where you wanna go. Um, and if the property was sold, the trustee has full authority to sell. So no is the answer. Lisa, I'm going to get back to you and let you ask um, Rex the question or explain yours in just a yeah, second. Just send me an email. Yeah, send me an email and I'll answer it. Okay, and then somebody asked if you would recommend uh, for a power of attorney or HIPAA depository. A power of attorney or HIPAA depository. Well, Do you recommend a POA depository? No, what... I have thought about that might make sense is, you know, we have Dropbox, we have uh, Google Drive, we have all these online things. And if you put the links in your estate planning document, you can put it in the cloud on your own. You don't have to pay uh, a third party to put it under some website that says that it's a repository. Um, as long as a person can access it, you're fine. Okay, so Lisa, do you want to explain to Rex what you what you talked about about the deed in Alabama? And sure, thank you. The client is in California, and she's a power of attorney of her father. The father had real estate in Alabama, so she was selling it for him. So she, we had to send the power of attorney to Alabama. We didn't put a cover sheet on it. The Alabama courts stamped the original page. So uh, my question was, will that affect anything or if she wants to use it in California with an Alabama stamp on it? Okay, so there's more than one issue going on here. First of all, you're trying to use the durable power of attorney in Alabama and a title company would tell you if they would accept a court stamp versus a recorder stamp but it was never recorded in Alabama, but 
the court may have higher authority than the um, than the recorder's office. But when you come back to California, it's a matter of whether the document was notarized when it was created. And if so, Alabama doesn't have any impact and you would still record it in, um, in California in the clerk recorder's office. Right, but I, we don't need to record it in California. We just, in, in case she has to use that power of attorney to a, a bank or something to prove that she's the attorney in fact. Okay, is there a probate? In Alabama. Yes, is the answer? Oh, yes, in Alabama for the Alabama property. Okay, if you've got a probate, you do not need a durable power of attorney. The probate judge is in charge of the real property in their jurisdiction. So you will get an order from the judge. Frequently in California, we uh, petition the court that we're gonna be selling it. And then they have an overbid process, but your durable power of attorney does not seem to have a need in Alabama since the probate court is higher in authority than the DPOA. Okay, I think I get it, okay. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, okay. you'll end up looking for a court order that says exactly what you want. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so that's all the questions. I think we're done, it's a little bit after seven. I think we have one more uh, class next month. Is that correct, Rex? I think it's gonna be on advanced healthcare directives. Yes, and uh, boy, I've, got, I've been looking into that. I got some uh, surprises up my sleeve on that one. And uh, yeah. That's going to be, I think, the second Thursday in uh, December on uh, advanced health care directives plus end of life decisions. So we're going to be covering uh, a lot of diverse concepts. Thanks for your comment, Sherry. Car Sherry said, thanks, Rex, for a really good class. So um and Rex always welcomes emails. So if anybody has a question, he's happy to right. email you. Thanks, Colleen. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Lori. Everybody's saying thank you. So uh, we'll sign off now. Okay. It's Good night, fun. Rex. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, everybody.